Okay, well, my name is Mark Kirshner. I'm from Harvard University. And I want to talk in this lecture about evolution from a more modern perspective of cell and developmental biology and molecular biology. And I really want to explain this word evolvability, which is hard to pronounce. As I say, if you say it three times quickly, everybody chokes on the word. Um, and some people think it's maybe uh, something that contradicts Darwin's theory of evolution, which, of course, it doesn't contradict Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, and it augments it, really. And some people think in the evolutionary community uh, at one time, they thought this word might have some sense of orthogenesis, that is, uh, some predestination of evolution to a certain end, like human beings. And of course, it doesn't have that as well. Uh, so the, we're going to define this word by example and uh, show why it's uh, powerful and important to understand in evolutionary theory. Now, we can all agree that evolution is successful and creative. It's been so creative and so successful that people doubted that uh, it really uh, could be explained by natural principles, such as those of Darwin. It's still hard to imagine that out of some primeval ooze, uh, all these various beautiful life forms appeared on this planet. And I think what we'll talk about today may be something which helps explain the ease by which these things happen. So it doesn't explain how each one happened, uh, but it explains some of the underlying processes that are not too obvious unless you do deep, uh, dig deeply into uh, molecular and cellular processes underneath them. So let's start with Darwin's big idea. He had two really uh, major concepts of his idea. He wrote them down in his notebook when he came back from the voyage of the Beetle, Beagle, and that uh, was published. Uh, and that is that all life on Earth comes from a common origin. So you see that sort of tree at the bottom with its common origin on the left, and uh, the various branches all coming from the same source. Remember, he said that before we knew as much as we do about the underlying molecular similarity among organisms. And he also believed, the second big idea, is it proceeds by a process of heritable change and selection. And the selection is on the organism itself, on what we call the phenotype, and that includes its anatomy, its physiology, its behavior. And again, if you look at the bottom on the right, you see the anatomy of the finches that he found on the very species of finches that he found on the islands of the Galapagos, uh, which uh, we now believe originated from a simple founding species that under the pressure of selection, which was mostly the nature of the food and the temperature, uh, developed various different shapes appropriate to the kind of food that was available to them. And that very, very much influenced him as well. Now, here's the problem. Uh, we understand selection. That's something that Darwin really based a lot on, uh, on animal husbandry and plant selection. We could see that in terms of human intervention. Uh, and, uh, but where does the novelty come from on which selection can act? And uh, he believed uh, that there was random variation in the phenotype, which was, heredit, uh, which was inherited. Of course, he didn't know at that time how it was inherited. And um, he made certain assumptions about the nature of that variation. He assumed that variation was plentiful, so, so that selection had a lot to act on. So all these various forms that we see are um, a result of selection going in many, many different directions. He believed that variation was like clay, capable of being molded in every direction, so that selection could choose any of all possible variant phenotypes. And he also believed that each step of variation was small, even imperceptible. Now, um, those were his assumptions. 
he didn't really uh, have evidence to support them, except this he felt was necessary for the Vrieri theory to be successful. But it's, there's a serious problem. How does a complex structure like the eye emerge from small evolutionary steps? If only, the only, it's only functional when all parts are assembled. So here we see a drawing of the eye, and we see the lens, which was necessary. We see the uh, retina, which is necessary. Um, we need to see the optic nerve, and of course, in the brain, we'll need all the parts of the brain, which we're able to interpret the images. So how could this all happen uh, when it only would be successful after it, all these parts are brought together? What allowed them to continue to be selected without any actually functional value? And this bothered Darwin a great deal. He made very good arguments about how this might take place, but it's always plagued the theory of evolution for a long time in the eyes of skeptics. I mean, for example, how would you, a bird develop its wing if only after it could fly, it could be selected to be a better flyer? Well, people have said, well, that Darwin's theory is a good theory for improvement, but not a very good theory for innovation. And we'll have to come to that. What level of innovation is being used to generate these uh, parallel processes, and how can they be selected together? Well, I think we are beginning to see that novelty is not what it used to be. That there's more knowledge about how novelty is generated than was extant in Darwin's day, when he really didn't even have at his disposal a good uh, theory of the cell. First, we've seen that steps can be large. A few genetic changes can significantly change the phenotype. Next, we can see even big changes are rarely lethal. You can have a fly that generates from two to four wings, and it still lives all at once. And big steps, very quickly, non-lethal. And I would argue, and this is something you could, you could question, but we'll see it come back later, that novelty isn't just random, it's biased toward useful change. Now, how can somebody be biased for useful change if you're making something novel? How would you know it would be useful? But it may be a modification of something which has been useful in some other form. For example, if we look at the vertebrate uh, um, appendage, but vertebrate, let's say, uh, arms and hands, um, those are really all modified forms of something which have been useful in other forms. They may be flippers on the whale, uh, they may be wings on a bird, but the basic idea of uh, capturing space uh, is similar. And so there's a lot of utility involved in the kinds of changes, at least, that have been selected, common utility. So what I want to really be talking about is this question, as I say, of evolvability, this unpronounceable word, it, as a process of generating the right kind of novelty. And it's the capacity of an organism to generate novelty that tends to be non-lethal, because any novelty that may be useful to the individual in one generation, which is not heritable, it's not passed on to the next generation, is, uh, does not contribute to evolution. And if the animal just dies because of the novelty, it's not useful either. And it's also a kind of novelty that's likely to be useful, because there, there are so many directions where which way novelty can go that if you bias it in some direction, it may be more useful, you have a much larger likelihood of generating something which will be useful and selected for in evolution. So here are four general types of evolvability that I want to talk about. Um, one is regulatory change, which is changing the time, the place, the circumstances under which something happens. Another is exploratory behavior, which I'll define more, but it has to do with uh, a process which on its own will generate many different states. A third is compartmentation, which is a real problem, is how you make modifications in one part of the anatomy of the organism without uh, making it in other parts of the organism. So you may want to, uh, to put you know, hair in certain parts of the, of the anatomy and not other parts of the anatomy. Uh, these are the kinds of things that have to be worked out. How's that done on the molecular level? And the fourth is something called weak linkage, 
which is the ease in which one can make new connections without changing very much in evolution. So let's start with regulatory change. So as I say, it's a change in time, when something happens, time and place, time and amount, degree at which something happens, or circumstances. And at the level of a gene, we're talking about how a gene is used, not a change in the structure of the gene product. So here's a perfectly good example of, of how uh, changing the place in which uh, genes are, operate uh, and changing the amount uh, can give you quite a bit of variety, which has been very useful to me. And, and that is the, uh, the husbandry and, and selection that human beings had on the wild mustard, mustard plant. And if they selected for variations in the stem, they got kohlrabi. If they selected for lateral buds, they got Brussels sprouts. If they selected for terminal buds, they got clam cabbage. If they selected for flower clusters, they got cauliflower. If they selected for stems and flowers, they got broccoli. And if they selected for leaves, they got kale. So all this just time and manner and place without really changing the basic anatomy of the plant gave many, many different forms of the, the plant, which we found very useful. Let's talk about the case of invention of flight. Invertebrates, as I'm not talking about insects, of course, but vertebrates, flight was invented independently three times. Uh, once uh, on the right is the bat, which is the mammalian form of, uh, of wings and flight. In the middle is a bird, a pelican, which is the uh, bird form of wings of flight. And on the left is a pterodactyl. I'm very proud of the pterodactyl picture. It's very hard to get pictures these days of flying pterodactyls. Uh, but that turns out to be a separate invention of, uh, of flight. How did the, uh, evolution evolve flight these three separate ways? Was it all the same thing? Was it something magical and new? And when you look at just the skeletons alone, which of course are well preserved in the fossil record, so we have a tremendous amount of data on this, you see that, um, you know, that much of the animals are the same, uh, but the changes really occur, as you would expect, in the, the wings. But how did they change? Um, there was really no new genes that were needed structurally to support flight. It was really about the amount and the timing and the location in which bone growth occurred. So in the pterodactyl, you extended the bone of the fourth digit. In the bird, you extended the forearm and wrist bones. And in the bat, which uh, over here, you have uh, the forearms, which is the ulna bone, and the third, fourth, and fifth digits, which are extended. So it's really just about when you terminate bone growth in these animals, and you can generate a lot of other things. Now, you could argue, well, you, you need more than just bones. You need skin to cover those bones. But if anybody has ever seen a, a woman who's pregnant, you realize getting more skin to cover the woman's belly is not a problem, not to mention all the people who um, are obese or, they, or people who have burns that, um, that heal. So skin is something which, you know, you wouldn't need, probably even need to change anything about skin to have it covering the bones and make, and make a wing. The muscles, the same muscle groups are involved, but they're bigger, of course, if they're flying and, uh, uh, than they would be. But, but that's something at least uh, you could do over time by uh, selection on the, on the size, that is the amount of muscles of certain muscles. So it's the change in regulation of length, not how bones are made, or the invention of new bones. Now, at uh, the question about a change uh, is really um, that the 20th century taught us that things are more similar than we thought, which is, in some sense, reassuring from Darwin's first view that we all originated from some common origin, but makes it more uh, a question, more puzzling about where change actually occurs. If everything is the same, then we, don't, we, have to, we really have to find a place to explain the differences. 
Now, the, the similarities are quite striking. The human genome has about 21,000 genes. That's only one and a half times the number of fruit fly genes and only six times the number of a single gut bacterium, E. coli. And we share 15 percent of the genes with E. coli, 25 percent of our genes with yeast, 50 percent with the fruit fly, and 70 percent with the frog. So there's a fair amount of conservation that's going on. And does this conservation make it more difficult to change, which one may argue it does, or is it even possible that it's a certain kind of con conservation that actually facilitates change? And we'll explore that. Okay, so let's imagine some of the problems of making a limb. We not only have to have the bones, we have to have the muscles there to provide power. We have to control those muscles with nerves. We have to provide a blood supply for food and to remove waste. And everything has to be placed properly for the wing to work. That's still a tall order. Making the bones is, uh, is, is hard enough, but getting all these things to happen, and they have to happen in some coordination with the um, with the development of the bones for us to have a functional wing. And to help explain that, we need to talk about something which is quintessentially biological, which we call exploratory behavior. And I'll give examples of it, and um, there are many more examples one could choose, but I'll give them with the idea of trying to exp explain some of the changes in forming the wing. So let me de de define it. It's a uh, it, exploratory behavior is a little like evolution, except it's non-genetic. It's a non-genetic process of random variation, followed by selection for a functional outcome. And we're not talking about this in the course of evolution, but in the course of the life of the animal. In the process of exploration, as in any exploration, many futile paths are taken to maximize the chance of finding a functional one. So here's a wonderful example. It's not of a anatomy, but it's a behavioral example of exploratory behavior. And it's a question of how ants forage for food. Now, ants um, uh, don't talk to each other, particularly. They, they can communicate some, of course, uh, chemically. Uh, and uh, they don't see very well. They can kind of see, you know, light and dark. Maybe there's a little bit of imaging, but not much at all. So there's no chance emerging from the, ant, from the uh, anthill that they're going to be able to see the food in the environment. So they explore randomly. And what they do is, they, uh, as they explore, they leave a trail behind them of an of a odorant, uh, a pheromone. It's a little like Hansel and Gretel. They leave a little, a little uh, cracker chips. And then they, after they've gone for a certain time and they haven't found any food, they uh, turn around and follow the, uh, their, their path uh, by smell back to the anthill. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to find the anthill. And another ant might do the same. Mission failed, went off a certain distance, comes around, comes back. But one ant may have found a, lish, a delicious um, dead cockroach out there in the environment. And... Uh, when it goes back, it secretes more pheromone and reinforces the trail. And ants tend to follow trails, uh, and they uh, and so the ones that have come up, it's, it's a volatile trail, so it doesn't last very long. But when another ant coming out may smell that trail and follow it, find that same delicious uh, cockroach out there, reinforce the trail further, and over time all the ants will be following the major trail to the cockroach and not the, the feudal trails to, to nothing. And um, that's, uh, that's a way in which you get a structured outcome without any inherent structure just by lots of variation and reinforcement. Now, there's a problem with this uh, method in that you end up finding the first good food, not the best good food. And so this is something, if there are any graduate students or students generally in the audience, that there's a role for lost ants. That is, for reasons we don't understand, ants who are following a big trail occasionally wander off the trail at some distance. And uh, so that, that's telling you essentially that, yes, you could exploit what your professor has told you is a, 
is a gold mine of results, but if your mind tells you you might want to explore something else, it may be worth exploring it. All right, so that's a kind of non anatomical way, but let's go back to the limb. Uh, bone formation is the leading event, but everything else is exploratory and adaptive. It's not that it has to be told what to do, it finds its path by variation and selection. So the first thing after you made this, this limb like limb bud and this limb forming is you have the somite tissue which has uh, the muscle precursors, myoblasts in them, and they migrate out in all directions, but they find their uh, attachment next to the, the bones. So wherever the bones are, the myoblasts end up being there just by random exploration. And that's going to generate the power. The nerves also grow out randomly, and I'll tell you, exactly, give you an example of how that works. And the blood, uh, that's also true of the food supply in the blood. So random exploration makes this very adaptive, means that it isn't so difficult to get novelty. You don't need uh, five things happening at once. One thing can set the, set the direction, and the other things will just adapt to them. So if we look at, um, at the nerves from coming out of, the, let's say, the motor neurons that are coming out of the spinal cord, they migrate out in all sorts of random directions until one of them hits the target, and that stabilizes that nerve, and you then end up with the proper connection. So it looks uh, kind of superficially as if that nerve knew where to go. If you follow the actual process itself, it's, it's just uh, stabilized in the same way it looks like flies fly toward flypaper, but it's not true. They're not attracted to flypaper, they just get stuck there. So that's the same principle at work. So the next question I want to ask is how can these changes be limited to certain selections, sections of the body? How is that achieved? And this is by a process that I don't think we could have anticipated. Uh, there was no real um, uh, sort of natural uh, precursor to thinking this way, uh, except uh, to really study the biology in, in real depth. And this is a process called compartmentation. Now, in the embryo, as I will talk about multicellular animals, there's a pre-established map, not, not completely pre-established from the egg, but very early on, that divides the embryo into spatial domains. And each domain behaves differently in development and the adult. So this domain, uh, it's, like a, it's like the um, a map of the world, which has all these countries, and so you see it on the map, and one says it's Brazil, and another says it's, it's uh, Uruguay, and another says it's China. And they, they're there, and, they're, and they don't really make any sense. You know, they're not, they don't correspond necessarily to geography or anything, but they do divide the world up so well that by uh, knowing where, uh, the, uh, where something is in terms of that country, you can place it on the globe. So there's a map that's generated early in development that has every place in the embryo, uh, gives every place in the embryo an address. So compartments can be visualized early in the embryo. This is a Drosophila embryo. And these are compartments that are from the anti that go from the back to the front of the uh, embryo, and they're spaced from the anterior to the posterior end of the embryo. And the domains in the fly embryo, which is where this was discovered, um, are these anterior-posterior vertical lines, but they're also dorsal-ventral lines, and so their flies have about 100 such compartments. Vertebrates have about 200 compartments. These happen rather early in development. And each department, a compartment is specified by uh, a set of transcription factors and secreted signaling molecules. So it's not that each compartment has a unique transcription factor. It's the set that is different from the next compartment. And each compartment in the developing spine, for example, which is our, you know, the vertebrate example, tells bones or, to be different. So, for example, if we look at the, the bones in the neck, the cervical vertebrae, 
uh, they take a different shape than the bones in the thorax, which have ribs, or the lumbar vertebrae in the lower back. And if you were to take early on in development some of the cells from the, um, uh, from the say, the thorax and graft them into the cervix, they would make ribs in your neck. So the cells are told early in development that if you develop in this area, you will have a certain kind of shape. You will respond to the same signals differently. And it's this compartmentation which is preserved through 500 million years of evolution, uh, what happens underneath uh, ch may change, but the identity of those compartments remains. So, you know, it may be that, for example, uh, you'll have fewer ribs or uh, in, in that thor thoracic compartment. That may be the rules uh, for a different species. But, but what a, a cell does in that compartment is specified by this early map. And so that's what distinguishes um, the different local behaviors and allows evolution to take place without complicating evolution somewhere else. So you can vary the, uh, your digits from, you know, as I say, from the almost the digits of a, of a whale to the digits of a human hand to the digits of a bird, because that region of the embryo is told to deal differently with exactly the same information as another region of the embryo. Well, the last, uh, and I think maybe arguably the most important, is the most biochemical and more, maybe a little more abstract. And this is about the ease in which you can change the regulation uh, at, of, of uh, what's being expressed in, the, uh, in a given region or how much is being expressed or when it's being expressed. Uh, and it's a property of molecular systems uh, called weak linkage. So what is weak linkage? It's a form of regulation that's easily established and easily changed. So if you want to think about weak linkage, you could think about um, the electric plug and the electric outlet. You know, this, uh, it's an ancient system. The plug and the outlet haven't changed in, you know, 100, in 100 years. Uh, but what's plugged into that outlet and what's generating the power has changed radically. So it's a very conserved form which, which has its property, this easy change. The regulatory signal, which is in, in some system, provides little information and provide, it works really by permissive rather than instructive interactions. That is, the system already has several states and it just lets one state happen or another state happen rather than telling it exactly what to do. And this property of many biochemical and molecular systems allows easy evolution of new combinations. So what you have here in general, more abstractly, is a system that has itself an on and an off state. And the signal is just something that inhibits it either in the on and the off state. And the evolution of inhibitors is very easy in biological systems. All you can have for an inhibitor is something that binds to one of those states preferentially and you stabilize that state in a different state. And this works in metabolism, it works in transcription, uh, it works in, in all sorts of behaviors in the cytoskeleton. And so I think, um, I won't go into it in detail, but that just tells you it's very easy to plug new things in and out of, of outlets because that system already exists. It's, uh, it allows for change and uh, we can easily select what we put in what we, what we, uh, on both ends. All right, so I've, these, all these properties, you know, the regulation, the compartmentation, the um, uh, weak linkage, uh, all of these things provide evolvability, make it easier for novelty to arise. And I would argue that living systems are built such that minimal genetic change could cause large changes in the organism. So that says it's, it's not what Darwin thought, that it's not that the change 
is so infinitesimally small, it can be quite large, and therefore can happen more rapidly. But these are, ge are generally are produced without lethality because these systems are very tolerant. And they tend toward utility because in some similar way they worked well in the past and incorporated some of those features. So here we are in the modern molecular age. Um, and uh, we would like to understand novelty down to its molecular roots at the level in which genetics acts, which is down at the single amino acid level, or single nucleotide level, and drugs act, which is down at the small uh, regions of proteins. Uh, and uh, we have a long way to go. So I'm going to try in this last part of the talk to suggest a strategy in which we may be able to think about how to go further, though I want to stress, unlike things I said before, which I think are well established by example, uh, this is more trying to predict how we might approach such a problem. Okay, so um, we're very proud of all the molecular data that we've accumulated over the years, and we can represent the connections between different genes in an organism as a graph, that is, what activates what, when it activates what, but it's a very uh, complicated and presently uninterpretable graph. And it's, uh, and it's only a sort of binary graph. I mean, it doesn't tell you the strength of the interactions. It doesn't tell you the timing of the interactions. There's a lot of things it doesn't tell you. And this typical genetic interaction map is sometimes called a hairball because uh, it's so informative. So how are we going to get beyond... We, we, we had Darwin uh, telling us that uh, genes were important. He didn't know about genes, but at least genetics was important. Uh, we, have, uh, we have what I've talked about, evolvability, all these conserved processes, <clears throat> which can be plugged in differently, can be localized, and can, be, it can generate different states quite readily. They can uh, explore different systems and compensate and suppress lethality. We have all that. How do we get from the... And then we have, of course, selection. How do we get from the genes to the phenotype? And this is probably, a lot of people think it's the holy grail for all biology, <clears throat> not just for evolution, that is understanding the gene to phenotype map. And so, um, and that would be useful, not just, as I said, for evolution, but would tell us how the environment molds our bodies, our minds, our behavior, and our health. And it would define the changing conditions in which evolvability can do its magic. So we might extend our lives, improve our well-being, remove stress, or take the uh, clues from what we've learned and make changes in our environment, or even now in our genome. Now, how to go forward from the complexity of information we're building up and the goal, which is some sort of understanding, which means some real reduction in the dimensionality of this information to something we can perceive. Is there a possible way to go forward? So let's deal with two amazing complex processes, which I would argue have something in common, at least formally. Um, one is how random processes have evolved the human being in just three billion years of evolution. Many people find that remarkable. Some people find it uh, so remarkable they think it's supernatural. I think similar remarkability is how a baby or a young child in three years can learn a language completely foreign to him, not encoded in his brain in any way. And of course, that brain is not predisposed to learn any given language, but can learn any language. And that is a problem where the study has been quite different in form than the study in biology of evolution. Can we learn something about what approach to take by comparing the similarities of these two problems? Now, I would argue there's a striking parallel between evolution and cognition, at least on the formal level, not necessarily on the actual molecular level. In evolution, we've talked about novelty, evolvability, exploratory processes, compartmentalization, weak linkage, regulation. 
And on the cognitive level, we can see that the parallel to novelty is learning. The formal parallel of evolvability is learnability. It's how, you know, how is something written in a book so that you can understand it? It was similar to how, you know, uh, the biological system is set up so that it can easily change in a useful way. Exploratory processes have called reinforcement in cognition. Compartmentalization has been called modularity in cognition. Weak linkage plasticity and regulation rewiring our brains. Now, the people studying cognition have applied a lot of computer-based approaches and have made some progress in that. A new development is the understanding of cognition through reverse engineering and deep learning. Tremendous amounts of detail are in the picture of um, of any given picture, but it has to be reduced to something which can be then compared with some known detail, which may not be exactly the same, to recognize something as a cat, for example, in a picture. Uh, the same is true in a self-driving car, which has some principles of operating, but the detail is always changing. Or the ability of a machine a uh, computer to beat the, the top Go player in the world where there's a nearly infinite number of possible Go games that could not be uh, memorized or reconstructed. Some operating model has to be generated, and that's what we're looking for in evolution. So um, the question is, can reverse engineering and deep learning help us understand how evolvability operates throughout biology. I don't know the answer, but I think it's worth trying. Can they tell us something about the normal function and growth, health, and disease? Can they point to a suite of important molecular changes in evolution? I think this is something we have to try. But we have to recognize that this is a difficult process and we need certain requirements in order to apply these kinds of methods. So the answer to the question is yes, but, and there are challenging steps ahead. We need to be able to measure multiple phenotypes in some way, such a, and we measure their growth, their differentiation, and their behavior. We probably should be learning at small, uh, focusing on small graded perturbations. Uh, for example, by using drugs, or by studying steps in embryonic development, or by looking at very similar species. We should probably be studying these things in a natural setting. For example, not, tumor cells are so dysregulated, they're probably not good for studying how normal cells function in these complex circuits. And we need quantitative information, high quality molecular measurements. And it is simply not true that a large amount of big noisy data is going to work. So, and from that, we need to be able to derive simulatable computational models. So I'd like to sort of summarize just where we are and, and what we may have learned. Evolvability, I think, as a concept, has changed the way we think of evolution, the cell and the organism. It's dealt with the variational component in phenotype. And it's the variation which is selected upon. The selection doesn't generate the variation. So we need to know how variation is generated. Though evolvability helps explain evolutionary change, the picture is still blurry by the lack of even a crude map of genes to the organism's phenotype. And the formal similarity of novelty to learning, I think, offers some hope that we may soon be able to use new computational approaches to better understand the nature of evolvability, the nature of evolution itself, robustness, and most likely disease. Thank you.